Hi everybody, thanks for joining me today. We're gonna to talk a little bit about fuel injection as it looks on a motor. Now I know we've spent a couple of days going through a little bit about fuel system operation, fuel system characteristics, and a little bit about what's involved for componentry on a fuel system, whether it's carbureted or fuel injection. But I wanna take you around a motor and take a little look at uh, the different parts on the motor that we can see. Now we're looking at an older motor here that's a 3300 Pontiac engine, I believe this came out of. And this was an early, oh, early generation of fuel injection engine. Now that hasn't changed a lot today, but there's definitely refinements that have come along. But a lot of the parts we can still find on today's engines that are more modern. Now this particular engine, if you look at it, it's a V6 engine. And what we're looking at the top of it, and we were talking about fuel injectors the other day, you can see the fuel injection system on this one. And I, now, I'm gonna move this, this is loose on top here, but here's the intake manifold where the air and fuel will travel into the engine, which then is distributed into the cylinders. Now, sometimes they call an intake manifold a battleship because it kind of looks like a battleship. You can see the runners right here that travel from port to port. Once the air and fuel go down inside the manifold, it can travel down all the way to those ports that you see right there. And it is then swept into the engine cylinders. Now, you obviously see the ignition coil back here. There is a special bracket up there that is at this point Now, right here, this is the TBI unit. Now, a throttle body injection or TBI is a unit that's got a throttle on it. And as I open the throttles, you can see the butterfly valves inside moving. Now, there's no float bowl on this one like there is on a carburetor. So this is not, uh, although the, the throttle is mechanical, the means of getting the fuel into the into the uh, the barrels of the throttle body unit are done by injectors and this is got one injector here one over there and remember from last day that an injector is really simply a solenoid uh, there's a winding on the inside of the injector and a plunger and we pulse or send power to those two terminals one's grounded one is powered creates a magnetic field raising the injector inside and fuel travels through a fuel line from the back of the throttle uh, body unit inside of this little regulator assembly travels through the center of this little dist uh, it distributes the fuel from one side to the other some passageways in there and it sits ready to go past the injector once we pulse it and the computer does that it opens up and the fuel squirts inside of the throttle body assembly and they were around for a long time they work actually great they're a really reliable little unit and uh, I think lastly, I mentioned the air idle control motor. Now, on the side of the throttle bodies, they used to have a little special motor and its responsibility was to allow air through a little passage to go by the throttle plate. So it could, it could basically open and close a little passageway like a detour around the throttle plates. So we could control the amount of air supply then change the amount of fuel delivered and we can affect the idle speed as a result of it. So air idle control motor or IAC motor was a pretty important part of the injection system for many years. Now we're gonna go back over to this model over here and look at the fact that this one too has a throttle body, sits right up over here. Okay, where's my throttle assembly? Sorry, there we are. So when we open that, you can see the throttle inside, maybe a little hard to see, but yeah, you can see it shining in there. And that's opening and closing the air supply to the motor. On the other side of the throttle assembly, all throttle body injectors might be a little hard to see, but there's a special sensor down there. It's a rheostat. And what it does is when we open the throttle, it's like a volume switch that turns. It basically tells the computer how far the throttle is open and sends it's a signal in a voltage from one to five volts indicating the relative position of the throttle plate so that the computer can then say, hey, up the amount of injection going into the motor. Now this particular motor has what we call 
port fuel injection, sometimes called multi-point injection. And you can see on top, we have the upper part of the manifold, usually called a plenum, and the lower part of the manifold that's gonna send the air along down to the cylinders. And they place an injector right at the base of the intake manifold runners, right before it enters the cylinders, or the, uh, the cylinder heads rather, the ports in the cylinder heads. Now, once more, these are just solenoid activated injectors. They have a valve inside and you can see the two terminals, one will be grounded, one will be positive. Uh, and uh, that signal was sent to that injector by, of course, the computer. Now this one has six injectors. And when we connect the injectors together, we send the fuel through something called a fuel rail. So the fuel comes in, travels through the whole entire fuel rail, it's pressured up and it's just sitting ready to go in that rail. Once the injectors open up, it's allowed to squirt through the injector into the cylinder head. Now we've taken the cylinder head off of this one. But the cylinder head would normally sit right here on that side. This is for a model so you can see the inside of the motor, but you can see that, yeah, the manifold runs into the cylinder head just before the valves. When the intake valve opens, it allows air and fuel to sweep down the cylinder and then it gets inside of the combustion chamber ready to explode when we basically fire the spark plug after the compression stroke. Okay. Now, other parts of the injection system that are really important. Every okay, now every injection system has to have some way to know when to inject the fuel or when to fire the spark plug. Now, a little hard to tell in this particular model, and I'll take you to a different area after, but engines have what they call a crankshaft sensor. Now, in this particular motor, there's a crankshaft sensor sitting at the front of the engine, just behind a harmonic balancer. And there's a special little trigger wheel on there that when the crankshaft pulley turns over here, that trigger wheel causes a little magnetic sensor to create a fluctuating magnetic or a fluctuating voltage in it. And every time there's a, a little signal, a positive rise in the voltage and then a negative voltage sweep the opposite way, it's gonna tell the computer that it's time to fire the injectors or the spark plugs accordingly. So crankshaft sensors are really important. Modern cars will often also have somewhere on them a camshaft sensor. Camshaft sensors look fairly similar. They're located usually in the vicinity of the camshaft somewhere. So that's called a crank signal sensor or a crankshaft sensor. Okay, now this particular motor here, part of the ignition system, of course, but it's also part of the engine control systems is a, what they call a DIS ignition system. There's no distributor on this particular one. It's got individual coils and each coil fires two cylinders. And how this thing is triggered is not unlike a, unlike a distributor. It has a pickup mechanism, just like a distributor has a pickup, pickup mechanism to fire the coil. In this case, the crank, crank sensor will tell the ignition coils when to fire. So they're fired at the precise, precise moment they need to be fired at. All right, now on this particular motor here, I'm gonna look for a coolant temperature sensor and I think this one may or may not be showing. So we're gonna to go to a different one. That one might be a, might have been removed in the cutaway model. So we'll go to this particular manifold. So this particular sensor right here, really, really important one, is called a coolant temperature sensor. It sits into the coolant jacket so that hot antifreeze or cold antifreeze will be ex contacting it. And that way the computer can tell what temperature the car engine's at. Really, really critical because if we don't know the temperature of the motor, we can't calculate what ratio of air, what ratio of fuel to add into the air. So really a critical, critical sensor. Now going up here again, you can see the throttle body on this side, throttle shaft, but I'm gonna turn this throttle body and show you a little clear picture of a throttle position sensor sitting right here. It's usually a three wire sensor. And once more that throttle position sensor right here is simply 
a variable resistor. So when we turn the throttle shaft, it's like a volume switch sending a signal to the computer to tell it how far the throttle is open. All right, so we're gonna go for a little walk over here. We're gonna look at some other components. All right, there's our class. Now this is a model that we put together quite a number of years ago. And here you can spot some of the sensors on there. And you can spot the ECM that happens to be sitting right here. Now the computer will often be under the dash somewhere. It could be under a seat in some cases, it could be under a hood area. So they're in various places. Now some cars today can have up to um, 10, 12 different computers for various functions around the car. So not only the engine is controlled by a computer, many, many other things are as well. So here's an example of a crankshaft sensor. We've actually taken part of the crankshaft off an older car and we've cut it. We've cut the sensor out of the crankshaft and we've mounted it on, in this case, on a motor and we're spinning it. And you can see there's notched teeth on there. And one of these teeth has got a double notch to start initiating the whole sequence that's when the number one cylinder is up the top dead center we actually have a double notch telling it when and how to time the rest of the ignition cycles and fuel injection cycles so as those notches pass the crankshaft sensor it sends up a little alternating current fluctuation and that little signal micro voltage is enough to trigger the computer over here to then send a signal up to the wires go into the injectors to then cause them to pulse. And when they pulse, they shoot a squirt of fuel down. Now what happens in a motor when it's running, as soon as we start opening the throttle plates over here, our throttle position sensor is just gonna tell the computer, wait, we've got a higher voltage being read here. The brain then says, wait, we've got to add a little bit more fuel. So we go back up to the injectors and we add that fuel in to a, higher, uh, to a higher amount by pulsing the injector a longer time. The amount of time that the injector pulses is called the pulse width. The time on versus the time off. So the amount of time that it stays on in milliseconds is its pulse width, really important word to remember. And on this model as well, you can see the fuel rail traveling over here. Now, question to you, why do you think they place a little threaded piece on top of the fuel rail. Well, the answer to that is fairly simple. That's where you can put a pressure tester on there. We can actually measure the, the uh, pressure of the fuel going to the fuel rail. Really important measurement to know because if our fuel pump isn't delivering an adequate amount of pressure, we can't sustain adequate injection to the cylinders. Now, we have a gas tank in this case that is clear plastic. And if you remember last day, we talked about a float in there, and I'm gonna reach inside this little container if I can. Whoops, sorry for the jump. And you can see that I can move this little float up and down. And as we move the float up and down, there's a little rheostat inside of that sending unit area that sends a signal to your gas gauge telling you how high your fuel level is in your tank. Now, you can also see over here as well the fuel pump the fuel sock on the bottom. Let's see if I get a little better view of the fuel sock in there. And then the lines, of course, travel up through a, a fixture that sits inside the tank. There's a rubber seal underneath it. And then you see all the hoses passing up from the tank, traveling all the way up through a filter. And from the filter, it travels over to the fuel rail. Now, some of these cars, they used to put a muffler that silenced the sound of the pulsing fuel in there. So that one is a fuel silencer. Now injectors must have on, especially older cars, some sort of regulator mechanism. They have a little pressure regulator on the end of the fuel rail and the more fuel they allow back to the tank on the return line, the lower the fuel and the pressure rails are the fuel rails. These sometimes were prone to failure where the diaphragm inside would rupture and then they would end up leaking fuel through past the uh, regulator diaphragm into the vacuum line, 
which then could affect the performance of the engine because it would be burning extra fuel. It would actually take that fuel, suck it into the intake manifold through that hose, and it could cause codes to be set on your dash because the engine couldn't monitor its fuel properly or couldn't sustain a proper fuel ratio. All right, now a couple more sensors that you should be aware of. Once more, there is a, an example of a coolant temperature sensor that was taken out of the car, and that's the end of it. A coolant temperature sensor is actually just a thermistor. It's a resistor that is sensitive to temperature. As the temperature changes, the resistance value in the sensor changes. So they are able to calculate coolant temperature based on the thermistor reading or the resistor reading. Now, over here, this is an example of what a knock sensor looks like. And a knock sensor is just a mic, just a, a microphone is all it is. It's got a quartz crystal inside of it. When we get a vibration over here on that quartz crystal, it starts sending a small voltage, just millivolts, to the ECM. And it can then look at that frequency to see if there's detonation or pre-ignition going on. Some motors as well have an oil pressure sensor on it to tell when the engine's running. If it doesn't have sensor uh, pressure or voltage, it can prevent startup in some cases. Not all cars have that pressure sensor, some do. Here's another sensor really, really important. It's called a MAP sensor. This is typically what a Chevrolet MAP sensor looked like in the 1980s and 1990s. And it simply is a special sensor. It's got a, a a special plate inside that has a quartz plate inside of it. When it flexes, it can determine the amount of uh, vacuum in the engine. Now, this sensor is also a three-wire sensor. We'll talk a little bit more about the internal construction as we go further. I don't want to overcomplicate it today. But the MAP sensor stands for Manifold Absolute Pressure. It's simply measuring engine vacuum. And by knowing the engine vacuum, and by the way, the vacuum is read by going to the intake manifold of the motor. And if we know the intake manifold vacuum, we can determine the amount of load that's on the motor. All right. Now there's more sensors involved and we're certainly not through all of them. There you can see the spark plugs. Um, and there is a switch over here for a safety neutral switch is called. We can tell what gear selection is in based on how we turn this switch and that information goes to EM, ECM. There are more sensors involved in that for sure. Uh, and we're gonna get to that as we go on in further days, but there's a glimpse of some of the sensors.